Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shante Charles. I hope that everybody is having a great and wonderful morning thus far. Um, over here in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia region, we are having some rain. <laughs> and I'm actually looking out my balcony at uh, the rain today. And I uh, hope that everybody is having a great and wonderful day, even if it's rainy on your side of the world. So, we are back and we are in our Teachable Tuesday. Our Teachable Tuesday. And um, just want to start out a little bit with how God is flipping America. <laughs> right side up, as they say. Right side up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And um, I have... Please excuse me if I have some bags under my eyes because I have been up doing intercession. Um, and so I got about maybe four hours of sleep, somewhere around there, four or three hours of sleep. Uh, but that's an unusual thing. So um, sometimes we have to take the sacrifices that we need to take in order to uh, fulfill the obedient call. I'll say it that way. So... Um, if you have not heard, since the incident at Charlottesville, um, there have been either several protests, they're calling them Antifa or anti-fascist protests. Good morning, beloved. Good morning, Lady Barbara. Good morning, Pastor Ben. And those of you who are also coming in. There have been several um, anti-racism or anti-fascism protests around the country. Um, there have been several reports of people um, either in government or the protesters themselves have been pulling down Confederate statues. Um, I know directly shortly after Charlottesville, a mayor in a town in Kentucky, I believe, um, said they had already had plans to remove theirs, but they went ahead and announced it publicly. Also in Alachua County, um, Gainesville, Florida, as we talked about yesterday, how Florida and Virginia have these very similar issues. Um, Alachua County uh, took down their Confederate statue. And if you know anything about Alachua County in Florida, it is a um, stronghold of the Klan in Florida. It's one of the places um, where there is active Klansmen. Uh, also, Durham, North Carolina was where the anti-fascist protesters, they called them Antifa, um, protested there and pulled down their Confederate statue. The protesters themselves did. Um, and so those are a few of the reports that are coming in across the country where people are saying we have, we are fed up and, um, you know, so I would just tell you to just keep paying attention to that. Also, um, those who have been uh, taking place in these racist uh, freedom of speech rallies and um, some people uh, took it upon themselves to start assaulting the anti-protesters. There is a Twitter page. If you're on Twitter, um, there's a, a Twitter page called Yes, You're Racist. And they are actually in the process of identifying those who participated, those who were assaulting people. Um, they're identifying them so that they're either their employer can see who they are, as well as if they were a part of any assaults, they are trying to identify them so that they can be prosecuted, okay, and arrested. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in 2017, I know that we, you know, are a part of a, a country now or have seen how an administration has emboldened people to get bold with their hate. But the reality is there are still some consequences for deciding that you're going to take off your hood in 2017. Um, so don't get it twisted. 
Um, everybody is not as silent as we think. And um, there are companies, there are people taking note. Also, the uh, neo-Nazi website, Daily Stormer, that has been around for years, um, f uh, whose site was on or being run by GoDaddy, was finally pressured by people. GoDaddy was finally pressured to get uh, the Daily Stormer's website off of their server. So they tried to go over to Google and Google would not put them on their server. So it is, uh, time is getting hard and it should for those who want to spread this kind of vile, disgusting hatred throughout the world. Um, however, also take note that should believers or should Christianity be declared hate speech, you're going to see some of the same attitudes towards neo-Nazis as you see. Uh, you'll see that same attitude towards Christians. So we don't want to get it twisted. Right now, Christians are not being declared as, or the Bible is not has not been declared as hate speech. But we will get to that point because ultimately that's where all of this stuff is leading. Um, and so, again, once truth becomes declared hate speech, we're going to have a problem as believers. So I just wanted to um, let you know that. All right. So it is Teachable Tuesday, and I did say, I believe, that I was going to come this week and talk to parents. Um, I believe I'm going to do that Wednesday where I want to talk to parents about how your child can have a successful school year, how your child can have a successful school year. What are some things that you might want to know to look out for as this school year begins to roll on? And I want to give you that information at the start of the school year so that you can have success. All right. So our Teachable Tuesday, we're going to look at three books. We're going to look into our book, Uppity Women, learning about some more women who spoke their minds and why they were important in history. We're back in Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, slavery and the rise of European capitalism, and leadership secrets from the Bible, from Moses to Matthew, management lessons for contemporary leaders. So if you're ready, you can put some hearts on the screen and we will get started. All right, one person is ready. <laughs> you guys are moving a little slow this morning. All right, we started with, we finished off with Sacagawea and uh, Cassandra Fidele. Let's move on to a young woman named Elizabeth Blackwell, Elizabeth Blackwell. She lived from 1821 to 1910. Born in England, Elizabeth Blackwell loved history and planned to teach. Medical school was not in her plans. Frankly, she hated the notion. The thought of dwelling on the physical structure of the body and its various ailments filled me with disgust, she said. But Blackwell had a change of heart when a dear friend fell fatally ill. After her cancer attacked the reproductive organs, the woman insisted that her suffering would have been far less had her doctor been a woman. Admitted to Geneva Medical College, Elizabeth got her license but met steely resistance from male doctors. Not about to turn tail, in 1853, Dr. Blackwell started her own OBGYN clinic for women in New York. Later, besides training nurses during the Civil War, and opening her own medical school, Females Only. At 53, she crossed the Atlantic to join the teaching staff of England's first school of medicine for women. Elizabeth Blackwell. Mary Godwin Shelley. <clears throat> she lived from 1797 to 1851. 18-year-old Mary Godwin was hanging out with 
Percy Shelley and other literary friends at Lake Geneva. When storms confined the gang indoors, Percy Shelley at the time was Mary Shelley's boyfriend. Inhaling wine and laudanum, they competed to see who could pen the best horror story. Mary won using the plot line, A Ghastly Nightmare She Just Had. Encouraged by her future husband, Percy Shelley, she lengthened her story into a book, and three years later, it was published. A bestseller, it chilled the audiences and continues to do so. She called it Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. Its plot was partly inspired by electrical experiments scientists were performing on dead and living tissue in her day. Shelley's goal? A tale to make the reader dread to look around, to curdle the blood, and quicken the beatings of the heart. So, unfortunately, Mary Shelley uh, got her story for Frankenstein while she was intoxicated. Now, we don't need intoxication to believe that the story of Frankenstein in our day could possibly take place. Next uh, uppity woman here under the brains and brass section is Maggie Lena Walker. She lived from 1864 to 1934. In 1903, this remarkable woman made an unusual pitch to her fellow citizens of the black community of Richmond, Virginia. Let us put our money together. Let us use our money and reap the benefits ourselves. <laughs> Her audience agreed, and Maggie Lena Walker established the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, and we learned about her uh, on season one in our Pathfinders book. Uh, we read in detail about her life. As a matter of fact, Maggie is just now, I believe, either last year or this year, I can't remember, but I saw, I read the article that she's getting a statue in um, the city of Richmond, Virginia, acknowledging her place in history. Such a bank was sorely needed. For decades after the Civil War, blacks had no place to go for home or business loans. As its head, Mrs. Walker became the first African-American female bank president in the nation. Banking was only a part of Walker's economic development plan. High Energy Maggie also launched other startups, including a community paper and a school. All right, so those are some women in history. Um, hopefully helping to inspire you to go after whatever you're called to do without intoxication. Had to throw that in there. All right. Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. Let's see where we last stopped. Okay. Yep. Um, we, we're still in the introduction. Um, we were talking about, at the last place that we stopped, we were talking about the Pope and how uh, black Americans are often, and Native Americans are often encouraged to forgive 500 years of slavery, rape, murder, terrorism, excess etc etc but we also need to be looking at the other side of the equation to say where is the repentance where is the repentance so it's not just it shouldn't just be a one-sided call um for you know forgiveness to happen there also needs to be some responsibility on the side of the perpetrators to repent all right, so let us continue to look at what he said, and I'll back up a little bit. The Pope called the slave trade an enormous crime and an ignoble commerce. These men and women were victims of a shameful trade, he said, which was carried out by people who were baptized but did not live according to the principles of their faith. The Pope said he was addressing his message to Indians of all tribes from Alaska 
to the Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America. Like most religious people, the Pope is idealistic, but not realistic. I think he would benefit from reading Father de las Casas' books, The Disruption of the Indies and The Tears of the Indians. I would also refer him to Eric Williams from Columbus to Castro in Documents on West Indian History. After reading these books, he might understand why most of us, both African Americans and indigenous Americans, lack the capacity to forgive or forgive the monumental crimes committed against our people. In this short book, I'm referring to whatever to what Christopher Columbus set in motion. In his period, he set in motion an act of criminality that influences our very life today. He laid the basis for Western racism, misconceptions about people, and extensive use of organized religions as a rationale for the enslavement of people. It's a recurring event in history, and it, and it told us, as nothing has told us before, that history is never old. Everything that ever happened continues to happen. What we are dealing with now is more than the second rise of Europe. Okay? He's talking about people throughout the world are now fighting to get away from that concept. And most of the world are now prisoners to that concept. We're dealing with the reason certain things looked as though they were going to succeed and did not succeed. We're actually dealing with the reason the, Af the African independence explosion did not culminate in independence for Caribbean states. It achieved independence in name only, flag independence. However, in terms of actual economic independence, they are more dependent now than they were at the height of colonialism. It set in motion the exposure of the fact that once you are oppressed and once certain information is kept from you, you begin to experience some confusion about what independence consists of. The African Holocaust that Christopher Columbus helped set in motion is both historical and current. We need to carefully examine its initial impact in order to understand how it is reverberating. There's a need to look at the world before Columbus. So let's examine the world of Columbus's day and look at his impact on the Americas. Let's look at the world he did not discover. What he actually did, and he should, have, should be credited for this, he set in motion the exploitation of two continents for European domination. What was all this marching about? What is all this marching about? Okay, somebody asked the question, what is the difference between black nationalism and white nationalism? Here's the difference. White nationalism, white nationalism, nationalism, excuse me, basically says everything is for us and about us and we don't plan to share. <laughs> okay? That's white nationalism summed up. Um, everything is for us, about us. We control everything and we don't want to share. That's white nationalism. Black nationalism has to do with pride and understanding in one's community. It has nothing to do with cutting off resources for everyone else. I'm going to say that again. Black nationalism has to do with pride in one's self and one's community. It has nothing to do with cutting off resources for other people groups. So no, they're not the same. They're not equivalent. All right? The basis for them both are different. Columbus <clears throat> never set foot on North America or South America. He set in motion an attitude that is still with us, a concept called divine or white right, also known as manifest destiny. And most of us, if you went to any public school, you were taught about manifest destiny, okay? Manifest destiny is this assumption uh, because Europeans had the ships and the basic technology that they had the right to go into other people's country and to exploit their mineral resources, take their women, and rape them at will. That's what manifest destiny was about. And guess what? 
manifest destiny, that principle, that concept is still happening all over the world because we use this concept to go and invade other people's countries. All right. Interviewing and talking with people who are part of the military. Not one of them yet has told me that the United States goes into areas because of a humanitarian reason. They go into the to other areas mainly for four things. Gold, oil, land, diamonds. Still spells gold. So that's an easy thing to remember. Gold, oil, land, because of mineral wealth or mineral deposits, and diamonds. All right? It was just reported last night. I'm sure it skipped uh, a lot of people's notice because it came out really late in the news last night that North Korea, ding, 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 is sitting on trillions of dollars worth of valuable minerals. All of a sudden, North Korea is a threat to us. We have to go in and invade North Korea because they're a threat to us. Really? Are we going to fall for it again? It was already proven that the notion of weapons of mass destruction was a lie to give the government a reason to go in to Afghanistan, Iraq, starting wars, because what? They held oil reserves. Mm -hmm. So this notion of manifest destiny is the notion that quote unquote God has given them the right to go into other people's country and exploit their mineral resources, take their women, rape them at will. And they did all of this in the name of a God that they said was merciful and kind. Now, anybody who knows Christ, the Christ of the of scripture, knows that he would not sanction this. But everybody doesn't know the Christ of scripture. So when you start tagging God to your ungodliness, then guess what? People start saying, well, God is ungodly or God is unrighteous. So this is what happened in history. All of them, including the Arabs, used Western oriented religions, which made their God ungodly. Now, the role of religions in the, in the domination and destruction of African civilizations was ruthless. There is no exception. I believe uh, Desmond Tutu said it. Uh, I believe it was Desmond Tutu who said when uh, Europeans came into Africa, they came in with the Bible and we had the land. When they left out of Africa, we had the Bible and they had our land. <laughs> in other words, they used religion, they used scripture as a bait and switch tactic. All right. They indoctrinated them and basically said, we're supposed to be in charge. We're supposed to have your land. Here's the word. Now give us, not even not give us your land, but they took it. Okay. There is no exception. Islam was also as guilty as those who used the holy scriptures. The role of religion in this matter was so shameful that no matter how you look at it, the picture is negative. All of them at this time did more harm than good. Now, let's look at the world from 1400 to 1600 before we came to know it as what is called the New World. It was not new at all. During the Crusades, all right, a lot of people seem to forget this part when you're talking about history. How did we get to the point of Europeans wanting to flee Europe to come to the Americas? All right. During the Crusades, the Europeans had exploited each other, each other, white on white crime, European on European crime, whatever you want to call it, to the point where Europe was about to explode within itself. The Catholic Church, in its need for funds to build these massive cathedrals, and you all know what I, we've already learned about that, where that whole came, thing came from. In order to build these massive cathedrals and to support the priests, 
they had begun to fleece the people to the point where the faithful began to have some serious questions about the role of the church. Because remember, at this point, a lot of the church writings were in Latin. So the people were not reading the church writings. They were being told the church writings. And so the people were trusting the word of the priests. They were trusting that what the priest was telling them was actually in the word. Okay? It wasn't until they started translating the word into common English form, which is what a lot of people during that time they were getting killed over, was translating the word into a common language so that people could read it for themselves. Mm-hmm. So that people could read it for themselves and know the truth for themselves and not have to go through a, a uh, mediator to understand the word of God. So, because at this time the people were not understanding the word of God, the priests were lying to them and selling them what they call indulgences, meaning they were charging them for forgiving them for sin. That's what was happening. Think about that. So, the wealthier people were quote-unquote getting forgiven for their sins because they could pay for them and pay off the priests. And the poorer people, not so much because they couldn't afford these indulgences, okay? So, people began to have serious questions about the role of the church once they started realizing that some of the things that the priests were saying to them were not in scripture. The church and its desire to get still more money from the people. Why wow, we sound like 2017? The church and its desire to still get more money from the people created something called purgatory. So not just you got to pay for your sins or you got to pay for your prophecies 2017. Now when you died, you didn't go directly to heaven, you went to purgatory. And your family and friends had to ransom you from this so-called limbo purgatory. This is why um, when you would see a lot of movies, especially in the 70s, 70s and the 80s, that would deal with heaven, they were from this Catholic perspective of purgatory. Um, when you see movies where the person is kind of stuck and they're talking to their family and their relatives and they're trying to get out of this place to figure out whether or not they should go to heaven or hell, that is the idea of purgatory. The whole sense of if I um, do something good for humans, you know, then I can quote unquote earn my wings. That stems out of purgatory. All right. So this was a real doctrine that the Catholic Church was teaching people, all right? That your family and your friends had to ransom you from purgatory. So it wasn't even enough that you were dead. They would, they would convince your family and friends that you were stuck. <laughs> and then they would get more money from your family and friends to get you out of this sunken place, right? So the more money you gave the priest, the harder and quicker he prayed to get grandma and uncle from purgatory to heaven. And again, knowledge is power. So because people at the time had no idea that this was not biblical, they were going along with what the priests were telling them. So it was a religious con game played on the people of Europe. I'm going to say that again. Because even in 2017, we still have people playing religious con games. This is nothing new. It was a religious con game played on the people of Europe. They were beginning to discover this game to a point, And out of anger, Europe was about to explode within itself. Then a fortunate incident would happen. An offbeat hermit named Peter came across Europe saying that the infidel Arabs were barring Europeans from visiting the holy places, observing the holy grail, and visiting the place of the crucifixion. 
Michael Bradley in his book, Holy Grail Across the Atlantic, has proven that there was no Holy Grail in the first place and it wasn't lost in the second place and it wasn't where they thought it was in the third place. If you've seen uh, the series Indiana Jones, they talk about this, the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant. All of it is kind of centered around uh, these theories, okay? The Pope saw a reason he could use to cut down on all of this anger against the church. Hmm. So, we get to a place in history where people are starting to find out that they are being conned by the church. So the Pope deflects all of the anger towards the church into propaganda. And now it's not about coming after the corruption in church. Now it's about finding this holy grail and starting a holy war. The propaganda swept through Europe that they had to move across Europe in a crusade to rescue this mythological holy grail that was not lost in the first place because it didn't exist. They started to march, moving across Europe to the rescue. However, in the movement across Europe, they forgot the pent up anger against the church. This gave the church a new lease on life which would last until the rise of Martin Luther, who would then challenge the church again and lay the basis for what we know today as the Protestant Reformation. There were many crusades and many reasons for people going on crusades, none of which had anything to do with religion or God. The way the story is presented to you in school, you think it has something to do with holiness. Why? Because they call it a holy war. They call it the holy crusades and you think that they're doing something righteous it has something to do with european power and the and europe rising from what they call the dark ages and let me put a little note there they didn't just call europe the dark ages because of the lack of knowledge during that age they were also calling europe the dark dark ages because africans were ruling in europe Mm-hmm. Go study it out. It has something to do with Europe's search for something outside of Europe to eat. Mm-hmm. Something to do with European emotionalism venting itself on people outside of Europe. And something to do with Europe trying to find a scapegoat for its own anger. Europe was trying to deflect the fact of its own enslavement of other Europeans. They would call it feudalism. Now, if you're a history buff like I am, I love history. I love talking about history. Um, in school, right, you learned about feudalism. You learned about the land and the vassals and the lords. But what they don't spell out for you is that was also a form of slavery. Mm-hmm. Enslaving other Europeans. They would call it feudalism, but it was an enslavement. It was European enslavement of other Europeans. The Crusaders won all the battles in Cecil B. DeMille's movies. He gave them victories, but in many cases, in real history, they got the heck beat out of them. These well-dressed lords took with them common and ordinary people to do their work and their laundry, these common and ordinary people saw these lords with their tails returning home, being beaten and on their knees begging for, mer for mercy before these Arabs. Mm -hmm. They began to understand that these men who owned land over in Europe and controlled their lives over in Europe were less than God. In the meantime, back in Europe, some of the lords had given up a privilege that the old lords were still hanging on to, and that was called the privilege of first night. Now, if you have young people in the room or young children, go ahead and cover their ears for what I'm about to tell you. But this is history, all right? So people need to, to understand what was the driving impetus to get these Europeans to leave Europe in search of quote-unquote opportunity and better worlds and better lands. 
One, they were dealing with this, this whole religious issue. They were trying to deflect from that. Two, uh, famine, starvation. Then you had disease. Then you had people in Europe. Europeans were bucking against the enslavement of, them, of, the, of themselves by the lords or the landed people. But these particular lords had this ritual or tradition called the privilege of first night. And if you lived on the Lord's land and you got married, he had the privilege of spending the first night with your wife. Now I'm going to sip this orange juice. <laughs> Everybody should know what that means. I shouldn't have to elaborate. Some of the young Lords had conceded that the poor man should at least have the privilege of the first night with his wife and every night after that. But the older lords were still holding on to this tradition that they had the right to go into your wife on the first night. Now, when the old lords came back into Europe, there was a semblance of human recognition for the serf, the white slave on the plantation of the Lord. This semblance of human recognition would lead to more demands. It would lead to a fight against child labor. While it didn't lead to the banishment of prostitution, it would lead to workhouses and places where they could at least pull people out of sight, put people out of sight. Europe, as I said, had already lost one third of its population through famine and plagues. So really on the eve of 1400 AD, this is what you see going on in Europe. There's far less creature comforts than anything in Africa and Asia. Asia. They were engaged in tribal warfare in Europe as they are in, engaged in genocidal conflicts right now. Guess what has returned through the European tribalism. Guess who's going around marching from town to town with torches, demanding to take things from everybody else? All right, so this is not new. This is why we need to understand history. Only in Europe, it's not called tribal warfare. They will not deal with the fact that not only what is happening in Russia today is tribal warfare, it is also partly a race war. Many people forgot the millions of Asians who went into Europe and didn't go home. Asian men who came without women and didn't go home to satisfy their biological necessity. Indeed, if it is a necessity all the time, that's another lecture. Indeed, I think we've overdone that assumption. What is always a biological pleasure is not always a biological necessity. Let's concede that much. So, these Europeans intermingled with these Asians to create a European ethnic entity that is still in Europe. Europe was still hungry and awakening. And while it was awakening, it began to pay some attention to new light in Europe, which was Spain. Spain was then dominated by Africans, Arabs, and the Berbers. This combination of Africans, Arabs, the Berbers, and the Jewish financial managers known as the Grandees were totally in control of Spain, parts of France, and Portugal where the Africans and Arabs had lost power in 1240 AD. However, in 1415, the Portuguese got up enough nerve to attack a place on the coast of Northwest Africa, present day Morocco. It was a place called Cuta or Cuta. As battles go, it wasn't much of a battle. And as places go, it was very small. <clears throat> Some say it's about the size of Central Park, if you've ever been to New York. But this battle was a turning point. Okay. Spain had been under the domination of Africans, Berbers, and Arabs. And Europe had lived in fear 
of what they referred to as the infidel Arabs in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> Europe, being blocked from trade in the Mediterranean, cringed, and it was the Arab that drove the European into the so-called Middle Ages by destroying the European market in the Mediterranean. The Battle of Cuda asserted the European, and subsequently they began to claim access again to the Mediterranean. By 1455, arguments between the Arabs and the Africans over uh, approaches to women and Islam began to weaken the African Arab hold on Spain in the Mediterranean. When the African joins a religion, he's a Puritan within that religion. Other people join a religion and use it for their best interests. But when the African joins it, he takes it for its purest form. All right. Uh, the writer here says, I have said before, that we African people will outpoke the Pope and we will out Muhammad Muhammad in matters pertaining to both religion and political ideology. Spain and Portugal would now approach the Pope and the Pope would say to them, you two good Catholic nations, stop fighting amongst each other. You are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. You should read Eric Williams' book, Capitalism and Slavery. A lot of people think it's an old chestnut, but this book was written over 40 years ago and is still current and relevant in its information. The forgotten character that has not been taken into consideration, and I'm still on my way to Christopher Columbus, is Prince Henry the Navigator. Prince Henry got hold of a cache of maps which were mostly made by Jewish gold dealers who had been dealing in the Western Sudan and the coast of West Africa. The Western Sudan is comprised of the nations in inner West Africa as opposed to the coastal nations of West Africa. Europe then begins to see the shape of certain parts of Africa. They're no longer guessing on how big Africa is. Prince Henry the Navigator with these maps begins to open up a school for chart making and map making to let the European know something about other parts of the world. All right. There's a recent appraisal of a book called Prince Henry the Initiator of the Slave Trade, which is af ac inaccurate. He did set Europe European maritime skills in motion. In other words, the ability to go navigate um, use ships and go to other places. He did do that. All right. So using maritime information, the, the Africans and the Arabs had preserved at the University of Salamanca in Spain, Europe would now go back to sea because it had actually previously forgotten longitude and latitude. Remember, the Arabs came in and destroyed some of their uh, learning some of the things that they had learned. In other words, when they put a ship out to sea, they wouldn't know which way to turn it, and they didn't know east from west. Now think about that. Hmm. Why would God allow these Europeans to lose direction, to lose understanding of direction, so that when they put a ship out to sea, they wouldn't know what direction to go in. I'm going to sip my orange juice. <laughs> Why would God cause them to forget how to leave their land and go to other people's land? Perhaps because he knew that when they set out, that they would go out in his name, plundering. That challenge from Mediterranean Africans, the challenge of the Moors, the challenge of the Arabs, had driven Europe into the Middle Ages and had dulled the senses of Europe to the fact that they lived now in fear. Prince Henry, while called the navigator, didn't navigate anything and there's no evidence that he ever went to sea. The main thing he did was introduce Europe to maritime information. The European, in turn, used this information coming out of China, 
then the leading maritime nation of the world, to go out to sea again and to get rid of some of their old wives' tales about the sea. Some of the tales, of course, were, and some people are still, they're now back at this discussion. Some of the tales were that if you go so far, the sea drops off, the world was flat and not round. The European had to make up his mind. All the hunger, all the famine now, that he had ships and guns, the European didn't care what shape the world was in, round or flat. He wanted it all, round or flat. Sometimes African people approach European power brokers with the assumption that Europeans are going to give us back things that they had already taken from us. They took it from you. Hello? If they took it from you, they're not just going to willingly give it back. Um, we clearly see that. I mean, here it is, what, almost 400 years from when the first recorded set of Africans came and arrived in Jamestown here in Virginia, 1619. It's almost 2019. I don't see anybody saying, hey, you know, we've, we've done wrong to black people for almost 400 years. How about we start trying to right some of those wrongs? There's not a whole lot of people of that notion. Some of them say, okay, we did wrong, but we, we still want to keep your stuff. <laughs> so it's not like they're like, oh, you know, we've recognized our wrong and, and we want to give you things back. No, very few of them do. There is some indication that a little known sailor, Cristobal Colon, also known as Christopher Columbus, attended one of Prince Henry's schools of chart making. So this is where he comes in. There he learned the basis of maritime skills and we have no evidence that he had or ever had any command, but this gets us into a mystery about Columbus. In the new work called The Columbus Conspiracy, there was so much dirt under the name Columbus. He maintains that there were two Columbuses because he says, no man could have been capable of that much dirt. This includes seven illegitimate children. When he is faced with the different children that were born and the women, he couldn't have moved that fast from one to the other. If he sired one over here, he couldn't have gotten to another place fast enough to bring another one into the world. We have to deal with another date neglected in history, which is 1482. Everybody, uh, a lot of schools teach the song, right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but they don't talk about 1482. In 1482, ships land off the coast of what is now Ghana, earlier the Gold Coast. They insist now on building permanent fortifications. Portuguese ships have been coming along the coast since 1438. They would take a few slaves out of the country in 1442. The Portuguese king, seeing Africans so well-dressed and seeing them bringing presents, assumed that they were visiting royalty and in turn gave them presents and sent them home. The idea of ensla enslavement had not yet reached his mind. The important thing about this trip when they forced their way into Ghana and the African king, King Ansa, differed with them and told them, if we saw each other infrequently, maybe we could maintain our friendship. Too much familiarity would erode it. He was beginning to see what could happen. Then in the beautiful last lines of his speech, he said, the sea is forever pushing against the land and the land with equal obstinance is forever pushing against the sea. He understood what could happen. But those Portuguese who could not sell him the Bible story forced the gun story on him. So first, if you don't hand over your land by the Bible, then they come back with guns. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. They forced their way in. And they built Elmina Castle, which is still there today. Lots of people who have uh, traveled to that region visit the Elmina Castle. 
It was the first of the great slave forts along the coast of Ghana. If 36 of the 42 slave fortresses are in Ghana, this tells you that Ghana was the headquarters of the slave trade. I mention this because there is some evidence to indicate that Christopher Columbus was a part of this expedition. Mm -hmm. 10 years before he sailed the ocean blue, he was over in Ghana. He says in his diary, as a man and boy, I sailed up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. So this was not some overnight plan. This was not some, oh, just all of a sudden, I just want to travel to new worlds. No, 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 no. For 23 years, Christopher Columbus was traveling up and down the hood of Africa. 23 years, Christopher Columbus was getting used to African trade, African people, scoping the people out and seeing how he could use it to his advantage. What was he doing up and down the coast of West Africa for 23 years? He was involved in the early Portuguese slave trade. Now let's go to 1492. In 1492, things happened other than the alleged discovery that was not a discovery at all. Let's deal with two African events that helped to set certain things in motion. In 1492, Spain was whitening up. Yes, yes. There's also, there's a process called whitening. Spain was whitening up through the marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. They began now to expel the Moors or the blacks, the Africans and the Arabs. If they expelled the Jews, and they did, that means they did not consider the Jews to be white. Most of the Jews were Sephardic. The same descendants of these Sephardic Jews are second class citizens in Israel right now. Though they are the majority of the population, not a single field officer in the Israeli army is of Sephardic heritage. Now this was at the time of this writing. Um, I would have to go and see if that has changed. All right. Even though they are the majority of the army, that army is dominated by European or Ashkenazi Jews. And the same is true of the Russian army. You've got millions of Asians in Russia. So I'm showing you that white is white left or right, no matter what they say they believe, religiously or politically, they do play the race game. You have over 30 million Muslims in Russia, but Russia has declared itself an atheist nation. Now this was at, of course, this was also at the time of this writing. Christopher Columbus in his early voyage would set a holocaust for hemispheres in motion. Expulsion of the Africans and Arabs from Spain would also set into motion the Inquisition. One of the slickest games in history was when certain Spaniards would tell certain people, especially the grandees, the money managers of Spain, mostly Sephardic Jews, give me your money or go to the gallows. I mean, this was a very ruthless time in history. Many Jews converted to Catholicism. Mm-hmm. They had to because they had to give up their money or be beheaded. That's what was happening. They practiced Catholicism by day and Judaism by night. They were called the Moranos or the silent Jews. Some of their descendants still live and are practicing both religions. The best known of their descendants is Fidel Castro. There's a good book published on him in France about Fidel Castro and his family, tracing his family back to the Moranos. He will go through the motions of being Catholic, even now playing that wise game. And we know Fidel Castro is, is no more. <clears throat> this expulsion will do Spain more harm than good because the grandees who were brought into Spain by the Africans and the Arabs were doing a pretty good job managing Spain's money. Spain has never had a strong economic system since they expelled the grandees. 
They killed the goose that laid the golden egg. I can say across the board, maybe with the exception of Cuba, show me a Spanish-speaking country and I will show you a country who's economically, who is run sloppily economically. And again, when he wrote this, Venezuela was not in crisis. Case in point. Any place in the world. Does anybody know a well-run country? They never got themselves together after they expelled these Sephardic Jews who had the money. Another event would happen within inner West Africa, the Western Sudan. The emperor of the Songhai Empire, Sani Ali, would be killed coming home from a minor war in the south. He drowned when his horse became entangled in an underbrush, crossing a minor stream. Now the great independent states in Africa are beginning to fall. These states are not coastal states. These are the inner West African states. These would have rescued West African states and saved them from the slave trade, but they were falling as well. They would go on to the heights of grandeur in the midst of the slave trade and in spite of the slave trade. So Christopher Columbus in 1492 set out for a new world. So let's ask some questions as we close because I can see I have run out of time for the day and we are not going to get to leadership secrets of the Bible, um, but we'll bring it into Thursday. How about that? Questions. Daring dialogue. Thinking. This man, as far as the records show, had no command position. He was not even a petty officer. How then did this obscure sailor become admiral of the ocean seas for the Spanish Navy? Who is behind this? Why is it that Christopher Columbus sailed from Spain the same week the Spanish expelled the Jews? Who exactly was Christopher Columbus? Was he sailing out ahead of the expulsion? Michael Bradley and others have now located those who financed the ships. They were all Jewish bankers who were told, give me your money or give me your life. They were the chief translators on the boat. He was to go to Asia. Why didn't he go to Asia? Sailing up and down the Guinea coast of West Africa, he had discovered from African sailors who had already gone to the New World that there was a possibility of gold in another direction. I suspect that Columbus turned his ships in another direction. He also discovered, as we learned in the book They Came Before Columbus, that there was a current in the sea. If you picked that current up at a certain time of the year, it would push you almost straight into the Caribbean islands just off the current alone. That current took him there. This is why ships were lost coming back, because if you came back too soon, the current reverses itself once every six months. That's why he ended up in Portugal on his way back. Once he got there, um, <clears throat> most people don't realize that uh, once Christopher Columbus got there, he began to realize these people can be exploited. Mm -hmm. The gentleman Eric Williams in his Documents of West Indian History goes through Christopher Columbus's diary, the best analysis of Christopher Columbus's diary that I've ever seen. When Columbus saw these indigenous Americans mistakenly called Indians, you know, my ancestors, he said in his monologue, I wonder why they're bringing such small amounts of gold. I wonder where the mines are. They'll be easier to conquer than I thought they would be. He would write a letter to Queen Isabella saying, from this area, I can send you as many slaves as you can accommodate. Listen, a lot of people believe that the slave trade happened one way and I'm going to close on this 
But the reality is the slave trade had Christopher Columbus picking off indigenous people and sending them back overseas. And that's something that people don't talk about. So yes, Christopher Columbus was sending slaves back across the seas. Then those same slaves were being sent back to the Americas. So what am I saying? I'm saying some of you all, um, your relatives were already here. Mm -hmm. Some of your relatives were indigenous to the Americas. They were sent overseas, but they still came back as slaves to their own lands. All right. That's the part they don't teach you. He never thought of partnership. In his mind, it was enslavement from the very beginning. His intentions were not good. He would kill off his own labor supply. He would kill some of the people who could have helped him find the gold. For the documentation on this, please read Father Bartholomew de las Casas' work, The Devastation of the Indies. It's a small book and you can read it in one evening or less. Father de las Casas is called the first historian of the New World. He wrote it all down. Christopher Columbus would go to him after the third voyage and the rapid disappearance of Indians. He would go and ask for an increase in the African slave trade, allegedly to save the soul of the Indians. When the Pope would send commissions to various islands, sometimes not one Indian would be alive, but the African endured. If the African endured and the Indian perished, it had nothing to do with the fact, as they teach in history, that one was braver than the other or one was stronger than the other. No, it had to do with the structure of their societies and it also had to do with the, with the fact that they were murdering off some of the indigenous people. Indians had a monolithic society and the African came out of a pluralistic society. Many societies functioning side by side. The Indian came out of a monolithic society which was tightly woven. While they existed side by side with other societies, they did not give other societies the same integration or recognition. Sometimes they waged war against a neighboring society. However, now the Aborigine is rapidly disappearing. Father de las Casas said that from 12 to 25 million people were killed We're not, we're just talking about the Caribbean islands alone. We're not talking about South America, although he also alludes to Mexico and South America, but his main concentration is on the Caribbean islands. So we're going to stop there for today. I think I gave you a whole lot to think about. <clears throat> Almost done with our introduction into this book, but he is setting the stage, setting the guidelines, setting the tone for you so you can understand that a lot of what we see today, a lot of what our economy is steeped in and built on, as one of my uh, fellow co-laborers, Apostle David Rogers, said the other day, there's a reason why some of these people are chanting things like blood and soil. Mm-hmm. For some reason, very few of us, maybe on the African-American side, okay, for some reason, very few of us understand that these trades are built on blood. They're built on blood. They're built on murderous intent. They're built on conquering lands through the slaughter of of innocent people. Okay. I know people talk about the shedding of innocent blood when it comes to abortion, but that is not the only blood that has to be answered for. All right. So we're going to stop there. Thank you all again for your time and attention on daring dialogues today. 
And I hope that I have given you some things to think about, given you some people to research, given you some things to look up concerning uh, the early European, what was going on over there, what was happening in Africa, what wars were going on that forced people and drove people into this, this sort of desperation, what kind of persecution was happening to the Jews during that time, the Sephardic Jews, that drove them to find a way out, to get out, as we like to coin these days. All right? So I hope that you have a great and wonderful day. Tell somebody, share this information, share this broadcast, and I look to see you tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be talking to parents. So if you're a parent, you know a parent, please invite them into the broadcast tomorrow because we are going to focus on success tips for parents to help their child nav navigate successfully through the school year. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. Take care and God bless.